Okay, hi, and welcome back. This is part two of the introduction to history of art to the Renaissance. Uh, sometimes we have to break these lectures up into multiple parts for technical reasons because it's easier to upload to YouTube, etc. So when these lectures get posted, make sure you watch all of the parts. I will put all of the parts together in the same uh, video discussion. So take a look and make sure you've watched all the parts. This part of the lecture is pretty dry. We're mostly going to go over some of the technical issues. It shouldn't take that long. Let's go ahead and get started. Right off the bat, we have a recommended text. Now, I do say recommended. I think on the syllabus it says required. Uh, but we are very flexible about the text. Uh, there is a series of readings. There are a set of readings on the course schedule at the bottom of the course syllabus that tell you what you should be reading for each lecture. Uh, the readings for the lecture are not just repetition. The readings actually give you a much greater basis to go on, so it's really important that you have those readings in before the lecture comes. I think it's even more important because we're not meeting face-to-face. -face. Without the uh, without the readings, I really think you, you could be lost. And so the version we're using is Gardner's Art Through the Ages, 16th edition, Volume 1. Volume 1 is the part that covers up to the Renaissance. Uh, you don't want to get Volume 2. Uh, it does come in a single volume version that covers everything up to the Renaissance and from the Renaissance beyond. You might want that if, for example, you're going to be taking 2720. Uh, the book is quite expensive and we very much understand that. So you can get by without the text, but I strongly, strongly recommend you get the text. If you want to, you can get an earlier edition of the text, say the 15th or the 14th edition, and those should be fine. But remember that the page numbers are going to change. So the page numbers listed in the syllabus for the weekly readings are going to be for the 16th edition. But I do list the chapter and subheadings that you should read, and so you should be able to find your way. Just know that if you get an earlier edition for cheaper, you might have to hunt and peck a little for those particular uh, assignments. As far as course assignments go and course requirements, it's very, very simple. We have exams, we have assignments, including a paper or research project. And then we have class participation and citizenship. Let's talk about the exams first. Exams are going to be a lot different online than they would have been had we taken them in class. Usually in class, it's an image test. I throw up a bunch of images, you identify them, and you answer essay questions. Uh, in this case, it's going to be all essay questions. Okay. Those essay questions are going to be based on the major themes of the class, okay? So you don't need to know the identification information. You don't need to know artist title, date, period, medium, and museum, for example. But those are on the study list, but it's still important to know those so you can talk about these things intelligently. The exams are going to be proctored online through Canvas through a software called Proctorio which is the worst sounding name. Sounds like the worst superhero origin story ever. But that's the name Proctorio. And Proctorio uh, requires that you use Chrome, and it will install an extension onto your Chrome browser. It will also lock your browser for the duration of the test. Now, the test is open book and open notes, and that includes the study sheet if you want, but it's not open internet or open friends, okay? The exam is essay-based. There's going to be five short answers, uh, two comparison and contrast essay questions, a little bit more involved, and three unknowns. And to give you a sense of how that works, I have a sample exam right here in this lecture. Plus, there's also going to be a practice exam. So sometime next week, I will post a practice exam, and the exam will just make sure that Proctorio and the online software is working for you. It's not a serious exam. There's not anything really too complicated about it. So don't sweat it. It's more of a test of the uh, testing software than it is a test of you. But it'll make sure that you know that Proctorio works for you. So I definitely recommend you take it. Plus, it's 5% extra credit. So how on earth can you lose? So let's take a look at what the exam would look like. So here's a sample exam. It would start off with five short essay questions. I'll show you an image from the study list. You don't have to identify the image, but you should be able to answer a short question in about 25 to 50 words. And it would look something like this. OK, 
Okay, so here it is, Leon Cathedral. Using this as your example, describe at least two unique features of the early French Gothic. Okay, so an answer would look something like this. You would identify something like the west work or the western facade, the western portal, uh, maybe pointed arches, flying buttresses, rose window. You only have to identify two, a short answer. And so there'll be five short essays like that that'll be very pointed, specific, factually based essays. You'll have to be able to conjure up important information. And I could ask that about any of the items on the study list. The next set of questions is going to be the comparison and contrast essay questions. And these are a lot more involved. In this case, I'm going to show you two images side by side. They'll both be from the study list. But I'll be asking a very deep question about these two objects, something that'll concentrate on the major themes of the class or something of that nature and you will have to really get into this. Answers should be about 200 to 400 words, uh, and they should be written out in essay format, and of course use correct grammar and spelling. So here's an example. Uh, I show these two examples, and the question here is about buttressing systems. And so uh, an answer to this kind of question would be something like this. And you can read this uh, and take a look at it, but it gives a sense that you understand that there is a difference between these buttressing systems, that they have their their pros and their cons, and also explain why maybe uh, one system would have been chosen over the other. These essay questions, the comparison and contrast essay questions, are going to have multiple parts, so it's very important you read the question carefully and that you also read multiple parts. So you can pause the window on this and read this, but this is also posted online, so you can take a look at this and get a sense of what I'm looking for. So there's going to be five of the short answers, two of the comparison and contrast essay answers. And then we have the fun part. We have the unknowns. I'm going to show you something that you haven't seen in class before, but it should look like something on the study list. It should look like something we've seen in the lectures or online, and you should be able to recognize it and briefly argue why you think this is comparable to the item off the study list that you chose. I didn't explain that very well. Let me do that one more time. I'm going to show you an unknown image, and I want you to select an image off of the study list that, in your opinion, most closely resembles it. Make sure you include all the information about the item on the study list, but I want you to then write an essay explaining why you made that comparison. Why do you think this was made at the same time as the item off the study list that you chose? Uh, be sure to think about technique, style, motifs, iconography, all the rest of that. So, for example, I could show you something like this. And an answer would look something like this. I compared this to the Sutnahu ship burial, and I give my explanation that it has a lot in common with the Sutnahu ship burial artifacts. It uses the same materials, garnet and gold, it uses the same techniques, it even has the same motifs. You can notice that there are little serpents and animal heads in the designs here, and these are, of course, very close to what we see at Sutnahu. So this is what an unknown would look like. So there's five short essay questions, two comparison and contrast essay questions, and three unknowns. You only need to do two of the unknowns to get full credit, but hey, if you give the third one a try and you get all three, it's five points bonus. So that's how the exams are going to work. The exams are going to be taken online, proctored online through Canvas, through Proctorio. The exam takes about an hour to take, but I'm giving you two hours to do it. So you have a 120 minute time limit. You can only take the exams once but you can take them any time during a three-day window. So the exams will drop on like Wednesday, and they'll be available all day Wednesday, all day Thursday, and all day Friday, and they're due by the end of the Friday. And you can take it any time during that. But you do only get one chance at taking that exam. Okay. So the due dates for those exams are posted on the syllabus, but just so you know, I'll repeat them here. So. The first exam is going to open on the 3rd of June and close on the 5th of June. And the final is going to open on the 24th of June and close on the 26th of June. So the final is non-comprehensive. That means it only covers the material from the second half of the class. It doesn't cover uh, the first half of the material. So you don't have to know the entire uh, gambit of material for the final. 
So those will become available, and when they become available, I'll post an announcement and let you know, and you can go check them out. The next big thing is a research project or a research paper. Now, I want to stress, if you are a student, you only have to do a research paper or a research project. You do not have to do both, okay? So it's an either-or situation, and you can choose. So if you're pursuing a degree in art history, humanities, anything that's more of a writing or research-based discipline, you're going to want to go with the research paper. If you're a studio or a design student, you can do a research project. So let's talk about the research papers first. So the research paper is pretty straightforward. It's a term paper. It's a term paper on a single topic related to something discussed in the class. It has to be on Western art, and it has to be on Western art before the Renaissance, okay? Because we don't we go up to the Renaissance, but we don't actually cover the Renaissance. We just give you a taste of where we are going towards the Renaissance. And the paper can be a new research idea. On a, It can represent new research, or it can be a synthesis and summation of the latest research on a given topic. Choose a manageable topic. Don't choose something too broad, like Egyptian art or Greek art. That's just far too broad. People are always choosing these broad topics. Uh, you want to focus in something narrow, something like the art of the Amarna period would be acceptable, or something like the transition between the severe period and the classical period. That would be a good discussion. Or it could be on a single work of art, such as the Mask of Tutankhamen. Some items have a lot of research on them. Some items don't. So a good way of gauging this research is, can you go quickly find five sources on this material. And if you can, it's probably a good indication that you can find enough material to write a paper on it. Uh, if you can find something like 20 or 30, it's probably too much. Uh, if you can't find five, there's probably not r enough written about it to squeeze out a term paper in a short summer session. So choose your topic wisely. And if you need to, go ahead, contact me. I can help you out. Now, before you do this paper, you have to submit a paper proposal. That paper proposal has to have a description of what your proposal is and an annotated bibliography with at least five academic sources. Okay, and the due date on that is coming right up. The due date on that is Friday, May 22nd. So you will need to get that in. Here's the thing about academic sources. Don't trust the internet. The internet is full of lousy sources. There's some good stuff out there, but most of it is bad. Okay, so you're going to want to go to the Fulton Library webpage and use their search databases, okay? And no general references, okay? No general references. That means not Wikipedia, not anything that has encyclopedia in the title, nothing that's popular interests like, uh, you know, a popular magazine, and you can't use your textbook. Please don't do that. You really should be able to find uh, five academic uh, books or journals that you can find either online. Now, I know the library has limited hours and is mostly shut down now, but you can still find these researches, resources through PDFs, through uh, full text resources, through the databases at the Fulton Library. Okay, And the guidelines uh, give a full rubric. I have a complete guideline online that explains exactly what I'm looking for and exactly what I'm grading for both the proposal and for the research paper. Okay, So research papers have to have a clear and concise composition and proper writing style. That means you must conform to the Chicago Manual of Style. MLA, APA, parenthetical styles are absolutely unacceptable. Do not do it. I'm looking at you. I'm watching you. People get this wrong every year. People think the Chicago Manual of Style is nasty, and I get it. It's a 10-volume monstrosity bound in human skin. But you can manage it, and it is very manageable. You can do it. So when you turn in the, ter the research papers, you need a final bibliography, footnotes, and figures, and all of that is required. You can turn in a rough draft. Uh, two weeks before the end of the term, if you want me to see a rough draft, I'm going, I could look at it for you, give you my pointers, and turn it around. That's the best way to get the grades you want, because then I can recognize if there's any mechanical or formatting errors, or if there's any structural or content errors. So do take advantage of that. You don't have to turn in a rough draft, it's purely optional. The final uh, paper is due on the last day of class, um, which is the 26th of June. So. 
don't wait to uh, get that started right away. And that's why the proposal is coming up. I want you to get started, get your feet wet, get into the research. Let's talk about the research projects. The research projects are a little bit different. Now, I do want to stress here, everybody gets into the research project and they think it's easier and it's not, okay? A research project is not just a gimme. It's not just, oh, I'll make something creative and I'll blow it off, no. These things are not graded on artistic merit. I want to state that again. They're not graded on artistic merit. They're graded on how well they demonstrate your research into the topic, which means they should demonstrate the same amount of research as a research paper and should demonstrate that you've really studied the subject and you know what you're talking about, okay? Yes, it's a creative project. Yes, I allow that because I've discovered that if you give studio students uh, a term, a five-page term paper, uh, they will, you know, be slitting their wrists or listening to My Chemical Romance and in endless uh, repetition. They just can't handle it. But if I give them a project, then suddenly, uh, you know, they'll want to make the entire uh, Great Wall of China at actual size and uh, produce and make something like that. So sometimes they bite off more than they can chew. So I want to do something that plays to your strengths, but this is not just a creative endeavor. This is not something for you to just bounce off like a springboard and make whatever the heck you want. This is something that has to demonstrate that you understood and researched something about a culture or a time period in the class. So what are some examples of kind of projects? Well, you could do a scale model, you could do a reproduction of a historical work, or you could do a demonstration of a technique that was known in a historical period, or you could do any work or original design that incorporates or reinterprets a historical style, uh, but you have to do it in a sensitive and an authentic way. I cannot list all the possible projects you can do. There are all kinds of projects and I'm constantly amazed at how my students are coming up with excellent projects that I never would have imagined. Let me give you a couple of examples. I had a student who was a dance student and they did a series of interpretive dances based on Hellenistic sculpture. And it proved that they really did understand Hellenistic sculpture. I had another student who was a broadcasting student and they decided to do a podcast. They actually called up an expert in the field that they were doing a podcast on and interviewed him for an hour. And that was their project. It was fabulous. It was wonderful. Uh, you might not be able to do something like that, but there's any kind of, of project. There's all kinds of projects that you can do. So a straight one-to-one -one reproduction is simple. Um, this is a reproduction of... Uh, these three women on, at a fresco at Canossos. Here's a reproduction of the tube Nebo Moon, as well as a reproduction of a marine wear vase. This one's also a reproduction, but this one's a reproduction of a technique. This is a reproducing the technique of cave paintings at uh, Lascaux. Uh, the individual here uh, replicated this breathing technique. Some students, uh, one student did embroidery. Uh, this was in replication of the Bayou tapestry. And another one did um, a pebble mosaic. This was in uh, replication of uh, pebble mosaics at Pella. One uh, popular thing is scale models. But I have to stress, if you're going to do a scale model, make sure you know what a scale model is. I cannot tell you how many people do scale models that are just crap, that do not represent the original in any meaningful way. Okay, scale means that you have to apply a consistent scale. You know, so if something is one-fourth scale, it is one-fourth the size of the original. So if you have if something that's 200 to one scale, that means every one unit on yours is equal to 200 of the original. Okay, uh, so you have to know what a scale is. Please don't attempt a scale model unless you know what it is. So here's an example. I get so many Stonehenge models, and most of them are worthless. Um, but here's one that's excellent. This is a person who understood what the goal of the class was. They made an accurate scale model. Um, this thing was actually exceptional. They followed the original plans. It reduced a lot of the detail. It was simplified, but you know, it was simplified because of scale, but it gave an accurate sense of the original, complete with the entire outer embankment, the avenue, the heel stone, all of these wonderful things. Here's an example of a bad scale model. This was a failing grade. This thing was terrible. Uh, all they did was slap a bunch of, you know, kind of clay things together and put it in a pot of moss. 
Why moss? I have no idea. I think people always confusing the superficial qualities of something for the actual qualities of something. Then, oh, the original is on grass, so I'll put it on moss. Uh, but if you look at this, you can understand why it's so bad. It doesn't conform to the original. The original has these wonderful structures called trilithons, uh, arranged in a horseshoe shape in the center. They're called trilithons because they're each made up of a of three large stones. So trilithon means three stones. And they're organized in a horseshoe. Um, this student did three whereas there should be five. So it doesn't even agree in numbers. It doesn't have any detail. This student, I, I bet you this student didn't even look at an actual plan of the original. They just looked at a few photos and made an impression of something, okay? A scale model is not an impression of something. It's supposed to copy it accurately in its proportion and its scale and its plan. Here's another example of a really bad model. This student uh, said that they were doing the Maison Carrie. Now, the Maison Carrie is a Republican period temple. It's in Nîmes. It's in the south of France. Now, first of all, you can just look at this thing and tell it's very amateurishly put together. Uh, but let's explain why it's so bad by comparing it to a photo of the original. Here's the big thing. It's not just that this is poorly made. It doesn't even conform to the shape of the original. Yeah, it has a staircase in front, but look at how narrow that staircase is relative to the staircase in the original. This thing has one, two, three, four, five columns across the front, and the original has six! I mean, if you can't even count the right number of columns, you shouldn't be attempting a scale model. And then it gets even worse on the side. He has one, two, three, four columns on the side. And when you look at this, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there's nine columns on the side. And they're not even spaced uh, the same distance. He puts in this swirly BS to kind of mimic this. Uh, this is somebody who's just belly feeling his way through this and doesn't even know what a scale model is. So if you dreamt a scale model or a reproduction, remember, it's got to be accurate. It's got to be a representative of the original. Now, that doesn't mean you can't reduce detail. For example, here a student did uh, a scale model. And you can tell there's some abbreviated things into it. They, they simplified some of the cornices into flat surfaces so that they're not really projecting. They, they turned the front door into a flat surface so it's not projecting. But this accurately captured the scale, the proportions, and dimensions of the original. This was done um, of a series of, of uh, pyramids from uh, Kush, uh, from Moreau, uh, which is this uh, late Nubian period of Egypt, and they revitalized the pyramid tomb. But it really does. It captures the essence of that. So this is fine. This is adequate. This is fine. Um, you know, you can do it and reduce scale, but don't be turning in stuff like this. You should be looking to this. Now, there's other kinds of problems that people have with these projects as well that I want to talk about. Now, this isn't a bad scale model. This is an adequate scale model. It doesn't have a lot of detail. The problem with this model is that it's a replication of uh, the temple of Kukul Khan, or the Feathered Serpent, or sometimes known as El Castillo, and it's in Chichen Itza. The problem is that they turned this in for a Western survey class, okay? Now, it says in the guidelines, it says online, it says in the syllabus, I'm saying to it to you now, that is not the assignment. You have to do something from the periods or cultures covered by the class. And so this student just blew past all of the warning signs and turned into something. And I had to give them a zero grade because they just didn't read the guidelines. They just didn't look at the requirements. It has to be from something uh, that is from the period of the class. And otherwise, there are things that are just uh, rushed, amateurish. I mean, this looks like it was hacked together by a, you know, a five-year-old. Uh, just terrible stuff. Don't turn in stuff like this. You will fail. You will get an F. Now, there are other issues that are important. I do have students do interpretations. I have students that don't want to do a historical reproduction or an exact copy of an original. So instead, what they do is they do something that is an interpretation. And I had two students that wanted to do an interpretation of Egyptian art. Uh, and one of them got an A grade, even though the rendering wasn't all that great. That's this one. And one of them got an F. 
this one got an A. And the reason why is because the student, you could tell that the student genuinely respected the original culture. This is a replication of an Egyptian stele, a funerary stele. And in this funerary stele, they put a number of things, including a representation. This is... Um, this is uh, the student right here, and this is their parents. And then there's an offering table with offerings and etc. That is, they created something that was personalized to them, but was extraordinarily respectful of the original Egyptian visual culture. It respected their vocabulary, their it respected their visual vocabulary, their idiom, their gestures, etc. Okay, and it proved that they had learned something about ancient Egypt and their visual culture. And remember, that's the point of the project. Prove to your teacher that you've learned something, that you've actually done research. Let's take a look at this example. This student wanted to do the exact same thing, but this student got a failing grade. Why did this student get a failing grade? Because nothing here is even remotely Egyptian. The figures are stiff, but their heads are gigantic and out of proportion to their bodies. Um, their gestures and their forms don't particularly look Egyptian. The iconography or things don't look Egyptian. You know, you have a modern guitar and an airplane there. And this is clearly somebody who said, oh, I like Egyptian art, and just used it as a springboard and did whatever the heck they wanted anyway. And it doesn't demonstrate your research. It doesn't demonstrate that you learned something about that culture. This does. This demonstrates. And what's funny is I actually think the rendering here is a little bit better. Uh, I think artistically, this student has uh, a little bit more capacity than this student, but this student got an A and this student got an F, just so you know. And this breaks my heart sometimes because I have students that will do beautiful works of art. I had a student who did a beautiful work of art of this person riding on the back of a Pegasus, sword drawn, etc., and was supposed to be based on uh, Greek art. And I looked at it and I said, wow, that's gorgeous, F. And the reason I gave it an F is because it had absolutely nothing to do with Greek art, other than the vague fact that the person was wearing, you know, a, you know, a sheet and was, and was uh, riding on Pegasus. All of the iconography, all of the imagery seemed ripped off from, I don't know, God of War or some other video game. It wasn't authentic to Greek art at all. And I've had other students who have turned in uh, projects that, to be perfectly honest, look like hot garbage, <laughs> but I could tell they had learned something and they had a good evaluation. That's the other thing about the project. You have to turn in a self-evaluation with your project to basically defend your project. And that's your best opportunity to put your, uh, you know, best foot forward and sell yourself. And I could tell from the evaluation and from the project that they had really learned a lot, even though the project may have been a failure, uh, the grade they got was an A. So it's not about artistic merit. It's about demonstrating your research, okay? So make sure you demonstrate your research. So just like if you're doing a term paper, a research paper, you have to submit a, um, a, um, a project proposal. Uh, you have to have at least five academic sources, just like if you're doing a pro uh, a, a project proposal, uh, a paper proposal. Again, no general references. Uh, no Wikipedia. Do not use your textbook as sources. That's all considered general reference or popular interest. Do not use those. Uh, and you also have to submit a self-evaluation with their final project. Now, there are full and complete guidelines on how to submit the proposal and how to submit the self-evaluation and what I'm looking for on Canvas. And I'll show those to you in a minute. So don't do these things. This is the same if you're doing a term paper or a project. Don't start this without reading the guidelines. It's the most amazing thing is students turn in things and they say, why did I get an F? And I said, because you didn't follow the guidelines. And they're like, what guidelines? <laughs> I'm like, you didn't know about the guidelines? Check out the guidelines. They're very clear. They're very explicit. Please go read them. Okay, so all assignments and everything is submitted online. We don't have any face-to-face -face contact. This is so sad for me because I love seeing these con these uh, projects in person. Students really knock themselves out. It's my favorite day, but nope. Uh, everything's got to be submitted online. It's got to be submitted in either a Word format or a PDF format. Do not submit it as a text or a WordPerfect or a Google Doc or anything else. If you set it in those formats, I can't see it and I can't grade it. 
and don't be surprised if you get a zero because of that okay and the deadlines are all posted the deadlines for the paper and project proposals are on May 22nd the deadlines for the the final projects and the final papers is on June 26th those are all posted online on canvas so don't let those slip by get it in late papers and projects are only going to be uh, you know accepted for severe medical or personal emergencies and even then I require documentation years ago I discovered that I have vast dark evil powers I didn't ask for them they just came to me and I discovered that if I set a deadline that grandmothers and grandfathers all over America would start dying about a week before that deadline I don't know how it happened it just does and I hate challenging people on this stuff. Uh, I hate challenging people on this stuff, uh, especially now in the days of coronavirus. But I really don't like late papers. I don't take them except for extreme emergencies. Okay, so I'm not an ogre. I'm not a monster. I'm not going to flunk you if your grandmother really did die. Uh, I don't want to be that person. I will help you out. But it can't just be for a trivial reason. And I do need documentation of some kind so if you run up against the wall don't wait contact me sooner rather than later and we can work a way that you can make it up but don't come to me after the fact and just said yeah i blew it off i'm not going to give you a shot to do it uh, i have no problem giving second chances to people who are earnest and trying and just struggling under difficult circumstances i do have a problem giving second chances to people who just blow off the assignments and expect that, oh, I'll just knock 10% off of it. No, I won't. I won't accept the paper at all. So it's got to be in. you got to make an effort. Uh, and if you run into trouble, contact me. I will respond. You can contact me through Canvas or through my email. Okay, so uh, I shouldn't have to reiterate academic honesty. This isn't all in the student handbook. But basically, plagiarism, uh, you should know what it is. A lot of people don't because... People get really lazy about copying things from the internet, but you should know what it is, uh, so don't do it. Also, cheating. Uh, again, a lot of this in this online class is on you. It's uh, on your honor and own integrity uh, and your own discipline, so uh, you know, don't do it. Uh, you're only really cheating yourself. The last thing that's kind of difficult is class citizenship and participation. Uh, there's no face-to-face -face meetings in this class. The class is asynchronous, which is just, just a fancy education jargon term for meaning that we don't have any set class times. The lectures are going to be dropped into discussion groups on class days. I record these video lectures and I upload them to YouTube. That way you can access them from anywhere. You don't have to even get into Canvas to access them. But I do post the links in YouTube and then in YouTube you can comment in the discussion groups on canvas i disable the comments on youtube because i don't want it to become a free-for-all i don't want the whole universe opened up to it i want to keep this just for our class but if you have questions you can comment in those discussion groups and those discussions and those video lectures will drop uh, every monday wednesday and friday until the class is done there's a course schedule at the end of the syllabus that tells you exactly what we're studying what lectures will drop what day so if you don't watch a lecture on a Wednesday and you catch it on a Thursday, that's fine. If you don't watch the one that dropped on Friday and you catch it two or three days later, that's fine. I understand it. You can watch them at your leisure. But don't wait to the last week of class and try to catch up on, you know, 16 lectures. You won't work. Uh, you will fail. So you can watch these at your own pace and at your own uh, schedule, but make sure that you exercise enough self-discipline that you can be there and that you can actually know this information. Okay. So if this class doesn't have any face-to-face -face meetings, you may be wondering, how do I demonstrate my participation in my class citizenship? Easy. Turn your assignments in on time and contribute to the discussions. Comment, ask questions, be assertive, share your opinion. Get to know your fellow classmates in those discussion groups. And if you have a question related to the course, then go ahead and send me a message on Canvas or email. But if you have a question about a lecture, put that in the lecture discussion. And that's a real clear way that I know that you are engaged and that you are listening 
and that you know. So that's how it's going to happen. And finally, come prepared. Read the assignments. Watch the videos in a timely fashion. Don't wait to the end of the class. Now, your lifeline for this class is Canvas. All of the lecture PowerPoints are already posted online as PDFs. All of the review and study sheets are already posted online. Discussions will be posted each regular class day with new video lectures. And so if there's any changes to anything that's happening, things still are a little fluid because we moved this online, you will find out about it on Canvas. So watch for the announcements, watch for the updates. That's what you're gonna need to see, okay? And so let's just go to Canvas right now. I'm gonna go to Canvas and we'll check it out. Okay, so you should be looking at your dashboard right now. This is my dashboard for Canvas. So if you go to the dashboard, you should go to this uh, image right here. It's the thumbnail. And if I click on that, that'll bring us to our class. And the first page that comes up is the syllabus. It's very important you read the syllabus. I know it's very, very long, but it has a breakdown that explains exactly how the course is gonna work. Like, you know, all course interaction is now online how you can reach me, uh, that the course is asynchronous, um, when will the lectures be posted, all of that information is there. And it tells you what the textbook is, it also tells you how the term papers and everything else works. It also has very helpful links to things like the Writing Center. It also have, has links to the Fulton Library and the Fulton Library Research Guides. Uh, it explains the research projects, everything. And it also explains how grades are going to be awarded. And at the very end, it has a course schedule. So you'll notice that for day, today, Wednesday 13th, the introduction should be posted. And also a lecture on Neolithic art is uh, prehistoric and Neolithic art are going to be uh, posted up, uh, specifically stone art. And I'll get that up later today, but it'll go up today. And then this shows you what lectures will drop on what days and what the reading assignments are for those. So here we have Gardner's, a 60, page 6934 for the second part of Egypt. It also tells you when all of the assignments are. Uh, on Memorial Day, we're not going to have any lectures drop, uh, but all of that. And then you have a course summary down here at the bottom that gives you the due dates and all of the critical issues for the course. Pretty cool. Now, if you go back up here to the menu, you can go to announcements. And there at announcements, we have the first announcement, which is welcome to class. And the announcement welcome to class gives you a brief introduction to the course. It's basically the same thing as the syllabus, but it's just shorter. But there are a number of helpful links to resources available in the class. But let me show you where those resources are. If you go to pages, Pages will have a series of video lectures, and the video lectures, when they get posted, will all be in this single page. But if you go to Study Lists and Review, you will have links to all of the study and review material. So let's say you wanted to look at the study sheet for the review for midterm. You could click on that link and it would download it for you. Okay, and so you could actually look at that study sheet. There's also PDFs that have all the images for the final and the midterm. You can find this same material by going to files. So if you go over to files and you go to review and you can say, let's just take a look at the midterm review. And here it is. The midterm review will pop up and it will give you the complete study sheet. These are all of the images that you'll have to study for, for the midterm. And if you want to see those images, you can click on the review. And the review is a PDF that has images taken from the lectures. It's gonna take a bit to load up. But there it is. There's the review, and if I scroll down, it gives you info on the midterm, as well as all the important objects that you need to study, all listed together, all off the study list. So that's pretty awesome. So the study lists for the exams and the review for the exams are already up, but there's also something else that's very helpful. I have PDF copies of every single lecture for the entire course, and they're already up. So if say you wanted to get ahead 
on the next lecture. Say you wanted to take a look at, say, lecture six, which is about the Bronze Age Aegean. You could click on it and it will pull up for you a PDF of the entire lecture. And so you can actually pull these PDFs up and have these PDFs open and ready to go before you ever listen to the video lecture. And all the exact same images that are in the video lecture, excuse me, all the same images for the video lecture are going to be here in these PDFs. So you could cycle through these and you have these open while you're watching the video. Okay, now I may update these a little bit. I may change out a slide or two, but these are virtually identical to what we're gonna be studying and they're already there. You could go read through every single one of these today if you wanted to. The last resource I'm gonna point out is discussions. And you'll notice that if you click on discussions, there's a pinned discussion and right there is a pinned discussion. And you'll notice that the first part, the first introduction to the course is right there. The second part is coming soon. I'm recording the second part as we speak, so it's not quite posted, but it'll be posted in about you know, you know 20 or 30 minutes as soon as I finish this. So there is where you would find it. And if you clicked on this, this will take you to a link to YouTube and you can watch it right on YouTube, okay? So all of this is available for you. You will submit your assignments through the assignment links so when you go to do your research or project paper proposal, this is where you submit it here. If you want to submit your final research paper or project, this is where you would submit it, right here. And if you're looking for the guidelines for these, you can go to Files and go Paper Project Guidelines, click on that. And say you're gonna do a research project, you could click on that. And here is this very lengthy document explaining all the requirements for how you submit a proposal for a project, how you submit your final project, your final evaluation, all the information is there. I even give you a rubric. So there's a rubric showing how am I going to grade each of these sections, how many points are for each part, and there are questions here that give you criteria so you know whether you have met the criteria or not, okay? The biggest single problem with people in projects is they turn in something that's just completely random and they, they have never consulted the guidelines. They just guess. And I'm like, there's no reason to guess. The guidelines are there. So please check out these guidelines. I'm begging you, please <laughs> check out the guidelines. I can't tell you how many people just never check them out. Now at the very bottom of the guidelines, whether you're doing a paper, or whether you're doing a project, there are a couple of extremely helpful links. And these are links to help you get through the Chicago Manual of Style. The Chicago Manual of Style isn't that complicated, but it's what we use in the discipline of art history, so you gotta do it. I'm sorry if you're more familiar with APA or MLA. Uh-uh, I'm not just gonna let you use what you wanna use. Uh, the biggest single problem is not people using AAPA or MLA when they should be using Chicago. It's that people just do whatever they want, that they don't realize that there is a set of strict rules on how you insert a citation, how you cite it, where you put the author's name, where you put the title, where you put the publisher and the date information. And what's amazing is they, they just kind of belly feel their way through it and make up so it's completely inconsistent. No. You need to be consistent and that's where you find it. You can go to those links and that's where you'll find it. Okay, so hopefully that's a good overview of all of the resources that exist on Canvas. Again, this is your lifeline. Don't forget it. You should probably check in on it every day to make sure that you're keeping up with all of the announcements and everything else that you need to pay attention to. Okay. Going back to the lecture, the last adv piece of advice I'll give to everybody is don't ghost. <laughs> what I mean by that is don't ghost the class. This is the biggest single problem and the biggest single reason why people fail my class. It's not because it's too hard. Uh, all the criteria, all the you know requirements are laid out. All the deadlines are laid out. All of the lectures in the PDF format are already online. Uh, the biggest problem is people just don't make use of them. They ghost the class. So don't ghost the class. Read. Read the syllabus. Today, read the syllabus. If there's nothing else you do today, read the syllabus. 
Also, read the book assignments in advance of the lectures. Watch the lectures in a timely format. Make sure that you check the announcements. Make sure you check the discussions. Make sure you check the assignments. Make sure you check the deadlines. Show up. Now, showing up in person for class is how you would do this. But since we're not meeting in person, showing up means manage your time. Take notes. Ask questions. Make sure you see those videos on a regular uh, schedule. Don't wait till the end of the semester, or just before the midterm or just before the final to cram all of the lectures. It won't work. And don't wait to get help. If you run into trouble, I'm not an ogre. Come contact me right away. I want every student to succeed. I don't, you know, I'm not a teacher that will only give out one or two A's. If everybody meets the requirements for an A, everybody can get an A. I have my standards and that's where it's set. So if you don't get an A, it's because you chose not to, because you chose not to take advantage of all the opportunities. So don't ghost the class. Otherwise, it's going to end up bad for you. I know we're going to have a great time. Uh, so far, I'm enjoying it already. I can't wait to uh, get some comments or more into the lectures. Uh, I really appreciate that you guys are struggling out there in cyberspace <laughs> watching these things. Uh, but hopefully, we'll work it out. Uh, again, don't wait to get help. I'm here to help. I want everybody to succeed. Uh, thanks so much. And I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.